Thank you. Okay, thank you so much uh, for coming, whoever uh, twisted your arm to do so. Um, I hope, uh, I, I appreciate it. I'm trying to think through some things, and I think they're worth thinking about, and I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about them and get your thoughts and questions. And in particular, what I'm thinking about are the ethical responsibilities that we should bear when we persuade people. Sometimes we persuade people to buy things. We're in business, we persuade people to buy things. Sometimes as a lawyer, we persuade a judge or a jury to decide a case in a particular way. Sometimes in politics, we might persuade people to vote a particular way or take a particular action. So there are many, many contexts in which all of us engage in persuasion. And I want to think about the ethical responsibilities we bear when we do that. Now, first of all, you may be thinking, we are living in a time when it seems like persuasion is less powerful. It can seem like arguments don't do much work, and that uh, trying to teach people the fine points of persuasion, engagement with counter-argument and subtlety and nuance, intellectual honesty and factual honesty, that's sort of like trying to to, to learn the way of the samurai in the age of the machine gun. Well, that's a separate set of questions, so just take my word for it. Persuasion is still powerful. It still matters in a lot of places. It's still crucial, and it's still very powerful. Advertisers, politicians, and good lawyers still make great use of persuasion. And so, uh, and, and I think that's good. One of the things that separates uh, a democracy from other ways of living together is that we try to engage each other with persuasion rather than bricks, for example. So, so not only do I think persuasion is still important, I'm glad that it's important, and I'm glad that young people are still learning how to do it because it's powerful. But with, like, like Peter Parker's uncle told him, with great power comes great responsibility. So I want to think about what are the ethical responsibilities that come with persuasion. And these, I want to identify four different things and then focus mainly on one of them because it's the weirdest one. It's the one you're least likely maybe to have at the forefront of your mind. And I want to situate this with other things. So we can identify maybe four different things that a thoughtful person ought to have on their mind See, I'm becoming comfortable with the singular they. I think we can work with that in the modern era. I resisted that because I'm kind of a grammar Luddite, but there are good reasons for it. There's a separate, that's a separate lecture. So let me identify those four things that maybe we should think about. One is truth. Don't lie. We will talk some about what that means in the context of real world persuasion because you could do some bad things even though you haven't actually told what's a technical lie. And we'll talk about what we mean by that. So that's truth. Next, we might say efficacy. Does the argument work? Does it resonate? I spend a lot of my time as a law professor helping my students not just to learn the substance of the law and the technicalities of procedure, but what makes for an effective and resonant argument. It turns out people who are very smart academically sometimes aren't so smart at that because that's more of a human skill than it is an academic skill. It's more about engaging with human beings and understanding what moves them rather than, oh, my argument's so much more clever than yours, I win, because they can just say, whatever, I still think what I think, right? So efficacy is the second thing. Why is that an ethical concern? That's mainly a pragmatic concern. But it's an ethical concern, too, because presumably you are persuading in service of some goal that you think worthwhile. You may have a cause or a client. You have something you are trying to accomplish that you think is ethically important or you wouldn't be doing it, right? And so you have some obligation to that. Maybe the clearest example is if you're a lawyer, you've got a client. But same if you're a politician, you're supposed to be representing your constituents. To be a persuasive advocate is, then becomes a part of a professional ethical obligation not just a, you know, pragmatic concern. So, so truth is number one, efficacy is the second, and third, I'm gonna steal the term that we hear a lot but then broaden it, you say civility. And by civility, I do not simply mean being nice. I do mean being nice. 
I like to be nice. It's good to be nice, right? Almost, but that's not all I mean. Matter of fact, sometimes you shouldn't be nice. If I'm treating you badly enough, maybe you shouldn't be nice to me, right? That's a whole separate question. What I mean by civility, though, is arguing and conducting yourself in ways that preserve the capacity of our institutions to be places in which we argue and persuade, right? The system depends on there being not only people who have the capacity to engage and persuade rather than just punch each other in the nose, but institutions and practices in which that can take place, in which we have some shared understanding of how we're going to talk to each other and what the, what the rules are, sometimes formal or informal rules. And some of those rules involve, uh, can go, we could say civility more broadly, civic discourse, right? When you argue, I think you have an ethical obligation to have in mind the implications or consequences for the way you are arguing on the capacity of your community to continue to be a place in which argument and conversation happens. That's what I mean by civility. And you see that the, what we talk about, don't quit yelling, is part of that. But it might not be the only part. There might be other ways I can undercut the capacity of our institution, like pushing the rules or playing a kind of race to the bottom game of chicken where, I, where you semi-threaten to blow the whole thing up unless the other side caves. There are a lot of ways in which you can argue short term that might undercut the capacity of your community to be a place where people argue. So I think that's an ethical obligation. Now look, all of these are things you have to weigh. I'm not saying, this is a, this is a, I will try to frame my conversation in a minute, but this is not a set of deontological first principles that every argument must follow. That's not the way I think, right? I'm more a eudaimonistic kind of classical philosophy guy. I'm just thinking like, what are the considerations that make for good community life? So you're going to have to think about that. Some of these will cut different ways in different places. Sometimes you will have absolute more normative prohibitions against certain kinds of practices. But, but I'm, not saying that, so I'm not saying that civility and preserving institutions should be everything. I'm saying it should be something. And the last thing I want to say, which I'm going to divide into two, we might capture as impact. Like, you should be thinking, taking responsibility for aware of that what's going to happen from your argument. So truth, don't lie. Efficacy, do a good job because presumably that's a professional and ethical obligation too. Civility, by which we mean don't blow up the process in the process of some short-term goal. And third, uh, impact. Take, be aware and take responsibility for the consequences of what you do. Now some of those consequences are material or what we might call external. Like if as a lawyer I help somebody or argue for some policy that's going to put a lot of people out of work, I should take responsibility for that. If I argue and get somebody off of a crime and they were guilty, I should feel responsibility for that. I should acknowledge first the external consequence. Everybody knows that. That you should think about what you do. And then you might decide, well, it's worth it because whatever, you know, everybody deserves a defense and that's my job, or it's worth it, worth it, worth it. So, you, so first acknowledge the, the, the concrete consequences of what will happen if you persuade people. That's accept responsibility for what you persuade people to do and the consequences. But I, now I'm getting to the part that I care about, the weird part. You also ought to take responsibility for what you do to people in the process of persuading them. That's the thing people aren't maybe, people are aware of, I'm not saying nobody's aware of it, people are aware of it, but that's the thing I want to highlight and think about. What do you do to people's character and to their communities through your arguments? Through the ways in which you go about persuading them. So if you want to describe this project, you could put a couple labels on it. You could say the ethics of argument or the impact of persuasion on character. You might say, my, my project, and I'll say so it at the highest level of generality first, then I'm going to give concrete few examples, and then we'll get into some of the murky details, right? So 
at the highest level generality, you should think about the impact that your persuasion has on people's character and community. And then that's one half. Then you should think about what aspects of character and community are good for people. So you think about the impact of your argument on human beings and their traits, capacities, and their community life. And then you think about, well, okay, if I'm going to impact what kind of people they are and what kind of community they have, I have to have some theory of what's good and bad. Otherwise, you're like giving people medicine with no medical theory. You're like calling yourself a nutritionist, no thought about nutrition. And you say, well, I'm not a nutritionist. Yes, you are. My point that I'm going to try to make is if you're in the persuasion business, you are in the constitutive business. You are in the character constructing business. You are in the community building business if you are in the persuasion business. You could pretend you're not. I'm just a salesman. I'm just selling aftershave. No. If you're persuading people to buy aftershave, as I hope to argue, you are also in the character construction, community construction business, and you have some responsibility for what you do to people in the process. If you say, I'm not in the character business, I'm a lawyer. If you are in the persuasion business, you may well be having this impact. Politician, lawyer, salesman, whatever it may be. So what do I mean? I will start with a concrete example. I might, if I thought that I could convince people to do something worthwhile by appealing to their fear and uncertainty about their Muslim neighbors, convince them that their Muslim neighbors posed a threat to them and use that to get them to do something, appeal to their fear, I would hesitate to do that. If I could sell you something, a product, by appealing to your vanity and convincing you this product will make you more beautiful, I would hesitate to do that. If I could if I could appeal to your greed and material desire for material wealth by convincing you that my plan will make you rich, I might hesitate to do that. Why? Why would I hesitate? Not necessarily because I'm lying. That's the first obstacle. So I'm probably lying about the Muslim neighbors. That's the first problem. I may well be lying about my product making you more beautiful. I will probably am lying about my get, get rich quick stream. So that's a problem if you're lying to people. Okay? But I want to set that aside because you can appeal to people's fear and xenophobia. You can appeal to people's vanity. You can appeal to people's material greed without lying to them. You could just be subtle like. You could just point out things that are true you know, highlight certain aspects of the world that, not lying, look at this, look at this YouTube video, look what these Muslim people doing in the video. Oh my goodness, did you see this? Let me share. You could, you could just gradually appeal to their vanity by showing them pictures of beautiful people. Don't you want to be like that? Oh yeah, I want to be like that. You could appeal to their desire for wealth, all without lying, okay? So I still think it's problematic. Why? because you nurture what you appeal to. If you appeal to fear, you are not just appealing to fear, you are nurturing fear. If you appeal to, this is my theory, and I'll try to flesh it out. If you appeal to vanity, you are not just appealing to it, you are nurturing it. If you appeal to material greed, you are making that a more prominent part of the worldview of the people. Now you say, wait a minute, one little argument, one little advertisement? No, no. It's cumulative, marginal, but cumulatively significant. Just like every economist knows that a tiny little change in the price of pizza doesn't make anybody think they like pizza less. But if you raise the price of pizza, fewer people buy it. In every other field we recognize that small marginal cumulative effects over time add up to big differences. And my claim is that if every, if here and there and there and there, all of us who are in the persuasion business, the lawyers, the politicians, and the marketers, are constantly appealing to, watering, nourishing your uh, financial, your, your uh, material greed, 
Okay, let's not end up surprised if we end up in a material greedy society. Because that's, that's the part of the, that's the angels of our nature we've been, we've been feeding, right? That's what we've been doing. So if we constantly, some people are so persuasive that they, their own, just themselves, their arguments, or have such a high profile that, that one person can make arguments that can influence people. But that's not usually it. Usually it's cumulative. All of us saying, what difference does it make? Everybody's appealing to vanity. Right? That's how you sell stuff. So we all do it, and then we gradually keep making people more and more vain. And like none of us feel any responsibility for it. Right? Everybody appeals to fear. That's the way you do it. It's the oldest political trick in the book. Come on, don't be naive. Fight fire with fire. Okay, we all do it then. We're all peeling a little bit. Aren't you afraid? Watch out. Watch out for them. No, watch out for them. Watch out for those black people. No, watch out for those white people. Watch out, watch out, watch out. Everybody, we're all using fear of somebody, right? So this is not a partisan point, right? Because you know I'm a professor from Ann Arbor, so you know I'm a lefty. But that's not my point, all right? This is a bipartisan point because I'm just as guilty of it, right? Of, of, of appealing to things without taking responsibility for what I may be nurturing when I appeal to it, right? And so that's what I want to think about. How do we conceive of that and how do we take responsibility for it? Now, I want to pause here and try to situate just for a minute my thinking in a kind of larger intellectual landscape. Because you may be studying philosophy or political theory and you're like, what was even that? Like, that guy Clark, what was that? He was yelling? I, what, is, what was that? Was that even philosophy? Was that, what was that, right? I get it, because the way I'm thinking is a kind of an empty space in philosophical and political discourse. That's, what, that's why I'm in it, right? I've been 25 years digging around, reading Socrates, trying to figure out what's up, and I've this is the things I've landed on and found it personally a little bit frustrating that I have not found lots of people engaged in thinking about these things. Not very much social psychological research on the character impact of argument. Now, I'm not hating on a social psychologist. That kind of stuff is very hard to measure and very hard to test, right? So social psychologists, social psychologists, they like to measure stuff you can measure. Short-term attitude change, stuff like that, right? So, there's very little of that. The philosophers aren't into it. So let me just situate it a little bit. It's mainly, this is the project, a version of the project that classical philosophy was engaged in. So this may be controversial. So if your philosophy professor tells you different, then listen to him. <laughs> but right now, listen to me. Because, because we try to make sense of Plato. Plato gave us... I, I like to think about Socrates. Plato created a character based on a real person. But I talk about Socrates like he was a real person. I understand he was a real person, but what I'm talking about is the Socrates that Plato has described to us. Same way I might talk about King Lear said this, that, or the other thing. Although Socrates was real, King Lear's not. I saw King Lear in London two weeks ago. Ian McKellen. Oh, man. Man. Okay. Um, I flew all the way to London for a weekend to go to a soccer game and watch him be King Lear, and it was worth it. Okay, um, uh, but uh, so, so what the classical philosophical tradition was engaged in was a project of figuring out what makes for a good life, a good human life. That's the way to describe it. And what they thought was key to a good human life was not objective well-being, and not preference satisfaction, getting as much as the stuff you want, they felt like that would be an endless treadmill, just getting more of what you think you want, you want, you want, you want, and then you want the next thing. And they, they didn't think of it that way, in, in those kind of what we might call consequentialist terms, nor did they think of it, here's the key, in what we might now call deontological terms in terms of first principles from which you derive rules. By the time Aristotle came along and started going that direction, although he was still talking about character. And then the, the modern tradition, especially since Kant, is, is loaded with a sort of deontological. Here's how you do philosophy. You establish your principles, and those are your premises, and things logically follow from those or they don't. 
And how do you figure out what to do? You get your first principles on the table, and then you boom, boom, boom from there. And that's how you argue about what to do. That's not what Socrates was up to. Say, deontological philosophers are up to like what's right and wrong. I'm not saying there's no such thing as right and wrong. I would be what you call a bounded virtue ethicist. In other words, I'm not focused on that, but I'm not dismissing, I'm not a relativist in the sense that, oh, whatever, whatever, whatever. That's not my point. But, but my focus is not that kind of philosophy, trying to tell you what's absolutely right and wrong. Okay? I'm going to leave that to your rabbi, priest, mom, something like that, right? That's not my focus, telling you what's absolute right and wrong. That doesn't mean I don't believe in it. It's just like, I can't figure it out. That's why I'd rather your mom do it. Okay. Um, what, I, what, the, what the classical philosophers were doing was not trying to figure out what's right and what's wrong. They weren't. They were trying to figure out what makes for a good life. How should a good man live? Yeah, they were talking about men. That's one weakness they had. I wrote about that in a paper. I wrote a paper about Socrates, and it was all about how smart Socrates was and the apology. And then I, just, then I called him out, though on his uh, blindness to the way in which his society treats women. There was a point to calling him out, because I was making a point in that paper, similar to what I'm making now, and I want to highlight that we should be aware that we're probably blind to stuff, because it's right in front of us. Like, we could look back on ancient Athens, like, how you did not see that? You up there talking about justice. But there's probably stuff we're blind to. I know there is, right? So, they were, uh, he was up to, the classical tradition was up to a project of not figuring out what's right and what's wrong, but figuring out how a man should live. Even when he talks about justice, I was worried I wouldn't take time. Now I'm worried I'm, okay. When he talks about justice in the Republic, he's not talking about right and wrong. He's talking about a, 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 a trait, a capacity. So what they felt like was, how should a person live to have a rich, full life? And that includes felt happiness, but not just felt happiness, right? It includes some normative dimension of what's appropriate for a human being. And then the next step is they felt like the key to that was not how much stuff you have or whether you get what you want. They felt like the key to that was what kind of person you can make yourself into. If you can make yourself into a person with courage and wisdom, and kindness, and prudence, and piety. Uh, piety is a word that's loaded in a different way now. A certain kind of reverence for things valuable, we might better put it now. If you can nurture those traits in yourself, you are more likely to live a rich, full, happy life that somebody will admire. But if you are cowardly, and small-minded, and selfish, you are less likely to live that rich life. Some would even say that the traits I first described constitute a rich and full life. Not just lead to, but constitute. That's a kind of interesting philosophical argument, how to think about that. But that's what they were talking about. What traits and capacities should we acquire if we want to live the way a person ought to live? And this is how we think, by the way. When you wish your children happiness or your friend happiness at the wedding, you don't mean, I hope you're as rich as possible. You don't mean, I hope you live according to some set of normative principles that I've derived. You mean I hope you live well, kindly, warmly, with good relationships and a, a work that's, sat, that's suited to your talents and worthwhile. That's what you mean? Okay, so th then, that's what I do. And I, and I try to figure out what kind of traits and capacities, I try to think about what kind of traits and capacities make for a good life, and then I try to figure out what our society might be doing inadvertently or directly to influence those traits. And all the lawyers were telling me for a long time, hey, that's not the law's business to worry about people's character traits. I'm like, the law's in that business, whether we admit it or not. And so we should fess up and try to make our influence positive rather than negative. That's been my argument for 15 years, but early on I wasn't very good at making it. So nobody listened, but now they're starting to listen because I'm, I'm figuring it out with Socrates' help. So, that's what I'm trying to think about. I wrote all these pa other papers, like about different institutions and what they do to us. And now I'm thinking about persuasion, because persuasion is the center of my art. Now, if you want to situate that, there's another way to situate. So I've just situated one way. I am reviving an ancient way of thinking and applying it to 
modern institutions and practices, including persuasion. Uh, the next way you could characterize it if you're a philosophy student is you may have heard of virtue ethics, the field called virtue ethics. A virtue ethics was an effort by, as Elizabeth Anscombe and others, to revive something like this ancient tradition. And when I first came upon virtue ethics, I'm like, yeah, here it is, gold mine, they're going to tell me what I need to know. But they bailed, the virtue ethics community and philosophy bailed on Anscombe's instinct to try to revive the way I'm thinking I've described. And they became sort of like second order deontology. They started talking about what traits are right and what attitudes make conduct right and wrong. They did this turn and they didn't end up doing it. So modern virtue ethics, which you think maybe will do the thing, doesn't really wrestle with the thing, right? And the, uh, the other place is that sometimes in contemporary political rhetoric, con contemporary ethical and political rhetoric, you will see discussions of public character and ennobling public character. Sometimes you'll even see discussions of rhetoric and its connection with public character and virtue, public virtue. I welcome that, those things. They tend to come from the right. They tend to be assuming a kind of particular general notion of goodness when they talk about virtue rather than um, uh, more the concrete different traits. But, but I embrace that tradition, right? I would love to have people say, hey, Clark, I'm on board, but I think we should nurture different traits from the ones you think we should nurture. Then we can have an argument, right? So there's some contemporary political discourse. Um, and um, so I think that this way of thinking offers us a way to think about our own ethical responsibilities. And I think it also offers us a way to make sense of some of modern political discourse. OK, so um, OK, we're good, we're good. Um, so let me say this. How does persuasion work when it works? This is a lawyer's way of thinking about persuasion, backed up by whatever social psychology I've been able to find, backed up by experience of all the old lawyers I've talked to. And that is, you do not persuade by the force of logic, primarily. You persuade by figuring out what kind of argument will resonate with the person you're trying to persuade. You persuade not with the abstract force of your argument. You persuade by, here's the phrase I like, making or finding space in that person's worldview for what you want to do or what you want to say. You got to make or find space in that person's view of the world for what you want to say. Because I can make the smartest argument in the world, and if it does not resonate with what you really care about and the way you understand the world and the way you understand yourself, you're just not going to be persuaded. I have seen very smart lawyers make very stupid arguments because they do not understand that point. And I've seen lawyers that couldn't hardly spell legal theory, what the law school's never heard of, would kick our butt in any trial because they have that instinct to look a person and listen and understand what that person really cares about and speak to that rather than some abstract, clever argument. So that's, the, that's step one. I would give examples of people like, but you, you get my point. People make arguments that, that they think will work for them, and then, but they, if they would take two seconds to think about their person they're talking to, they would realize that argument's not gonna work for that person. That's not how they understand the world. Like, like I'm, I'm, I'm big pro-gay rights. I speak, people do whatever they want, right? It's not even my business, right? So suppose I'm trying to make a, a, a pro-gay rights argument in a town to have a, uh, a, count, uh, uh, a civil uh, uh, ordinance, say let's not discriminate against people. I'm, you know, some kind of modest little anti-discrimination local ordinance, whatever. And then we have a, a, a conservative pastor on the, on the city council. And I'm a little worried he's going to feel like he needs to object to my, uh, to my uh, proposal, right? So I'm going to go talk to him. He's not going to look. He's not going to go join the damn Rainbow Coalition, but maybe if I could talk to him, he'll realize, all right, I don't have to fight this battle right now. It's not that big a deal, whatever like that. So I go talk to the fella. Now, suppose I come in there with my lefty Ann Arbor self and make this argument, make this argument like, look, look, here's the deal. I don't tell you how to live your life, and you don't tell me how to live my life. I won't impose my values on you, and you don't impose your values on me. That's the way they will come out from Ann Arbor and argue, right? So 
that argument is going to fail so bad. <laughs> that argument is going to fail because that's not the way that dude thinks of the world. He doesn't think it's my values and, and your values. He thinks it's his values. Now, I'm not saying you agree with that, disagree with that, right? I, that's not my, I, beyond my jurisdiction. But, but that's how he understands the world, as do a lot of other people, by the way. So, like, your, your argument is never going to resonate with that. My, don't pose my values, your values. That's not, how he, that's not the world he's living in. What are you, who are you even talking to? Besides, that argument is going to make it worse. Because what he's really worried about, if you would take a few minutes to listen and think, is not whether who's Zoom and who in the back room or whatever in the town. He don't care about that, right? <laughs> what he's worried about is the erosion of values. He's worried about creeping relativism. He's worried about, well, if there's no more right and wrong and good and bad, what next, what next? You know, next thing you know, people will be marrying trees. Ah. You know, he's, that's what he's worried about. He's worried about creeping re moral relativism among other things, maybe, right? You just made an argument where he's like, see, that's why I'm on, now I'm gonna make three speeches against you, my values and your values. That's what I'm talking about. You just blew it by not engaging. Okay, so that's the first lesson. You have to find, under, and that, that requires understanding. That requires listening. Trying to really engage and understand what people care about and why and how they understand how the world works. And, and then, you, then you might be able to make an argument that, that works. Okay, so if you were just a, a matter of diagnosing a person's worldview and finding space in it, then there might not be that much ethical responsibility. It would just be a matter of efficacy, right? But here's the thing. You don't just find space. You kind of make space you highlight certain aspects of that worldview for people. I came across a line in um, Homer the other day, and, and Odysseus is talking to his son. He goes, he goes all, right, all right, I'm going to tell you something else. He said, I'm going to tell you something else. And put this in your heart. Or the word is, the ancient Greek word plain, it's like means chest or heart. It sounds better in ancient Greek. It's like, it's like, uh, uh, alo, alo, to go areo balio enfrezi sacen. And it's like, put this in your heart. That's what you do when you argue. You put something in someone's heart and it becomes a feature, or you at least highlight some feature of their internal worldview. And like marketers know this. Oh, marketers know this. I read up on the marketing literature too. They're like, look, when you sell a product, you're not really selling a product, you're selling someone a picture of themselves. You're selling someone a better, prettier picture of themselves. That's what you're selling. Marketers know that they're selling you a way of thinking about yourself in the world, not a freaking shirt. <laughs> they're I, I wish I put, I, if I had, was using PowerPoint to put the ad up, that my Facebook feed popped up a J. Crew ad, because that's where I get my clothes, J. Crew. And the dude was like a handsome version of me. It was like a 50-year-old light-skinned dude with a gray beard, except he was like real good looking and buff. They're like, you could be like that dude if you buy the shirt. That's what they're telling me, right? And my wife's like, you're not going to look like that dude even if you buy the shirt. <laughs> but I bought the shirt. I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, so that's what you're doing. You're selling someone a picture of themselves in the world. And so you have to understand it and make sense of it and try to think about whether the picture of themselves themse that you're selling them, the picture of the world that you're selling them, is one that's going to help them thrive. It's one that's going to make for good community life. Are we selling people a picture of the world and themselves that's going to be corrosive? Or are we selling people a picture of themselves that's going to be ennobling? I remember my dad. I was young during the late years of the civil rights movement, but I remember, and he would, he would talk to people, he used to bring me with him, and he would talk to people like this. He would say, come here. He would say, you know what? I could tell something about you. I've been around, I've been around. I could tell something about you. He is a little stocky. I could tell something about you. <laughs> you don't judge a man by his color. You judge a man by how he takes care of his family. I've seen you in church. I, 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 that's how I knew I could talk to you. So listen up with this. That's how he would talk to him. He was, he was nurturing 
their capacity for growth. Now look, if the dude was just a straight clan racist or something, that would never work. But most people aren't just a straight anything. We're all always in the business of figuring out how we think, figuring out what's going on in our world, especially in times of change. It's so easy to judge people from the past generation or something that, oh, you know, whatever. We need to look ourselves, right? We're all hopefully in the process of learning and growing. All the men of my generation are right now just open our eyes to what life has been like for women all along. We thought we were so progressive because we didn't grope on anybody. Oh, I'm so great. I didn't grope anybody. <laughs> Only to realize, you know what? We should have stepped up. We, sh we were indirectly complicit in a world. Some of us still are because some still in denial, right? Oh, they're, you know, whatever. Okay? But we're gradually coming out of denial. Right? I told my little daughter, said last week, said, it's a tough week. Talking about the whole hearing, Kavanaugh here. She goes, Dad, it's, it's always been raining. Y'all just been hiding inside. I got three daughters just like Lear, and that was the little bad baby one too, just like his little bad baby one. <laughs> and she knew I had just seen Lear. That's the part where Lear wakes up to the play of the homeless, which he doesn't wake up till until he's out in the rain. And he's out in the rain, and he just stops in the middle because he's ranting, going crazy, you know. And you know McKellen, like, chews the scenery, so he's screaming, ranting, and everything like that. And they got literal water coming in the theater in London. It's all crazy, right? And then he pauses. He lowers his voice. And, and I don't remember the whole line. Something like, oh, you wretches, wherever you are, that bide the pelting of this pitiless storm, how can your houseless heads, your unfed sides, protect you in seasons such as these. And then he pauses, he pauses, he says, um, then he lowers his voice. He says, oh, I have taken too little care for this. Yeah, so that's where we are. That's where men are right now. We finally realize it's been raining on you all along. We're going to try to fix it, or at least not exacerbate it. And so we had to um, think about whether what kind of world we're constructing through our arguments, what kind of traits we're building, and, and how people see the world. And the point of that is all of us, even the old ones who think we know everything, are still in the process of figuring out who we are. Still growing. So everyone you're talking to doesn't have a fixed worldview. That means you're going to have an impact on it, potentially. I'm going to give you one more metaphor. Good, we're good, right? A few more minutes? Okay, I'm going to give you one more metaphor to think about this process. This is maybe help shed some light on current political discourse. And, and, uh, and that is, I want you to imagine that you have a map on your phone of everything. Not just the physical world, but everything. All of human history. All of experiences and everything. That's the map. That's where you're going to get all your information from now on. That's how you're going to figure out what to do. That's how you're going to figure out who to marry. That's your source of information. This is a metaphor for the world now, right? I know I'm heavy-handed. Like, we get your metaphor. Okay. This is a metaphor for your view of the world. The metaphor for limited human cognition to imagine ourselves having to view the world through the lens of an iPhone on a map, okay? Because our sight is limited in so many ways. So here's the thing with that map. It's edgeless. You can keep scrolling and you don't get to the edge. Here's another thing with that map. It's fractal. Who knows what fractal means? Fractal means no matter how close you go, it still shows more intricacies and complications. It never resolves itself. It's always more and more complicated. Plus, it's changing sometimes. And it includes everything. And guess what else it includes? You. Everything you ever did. All your failures and successes and the stuff you kind of wish you didn't do and all the stuff you did, that you didn't do that you should have, and everything your people you admire ever did or said, 
It also includes all the people that are suffering terribly. Now, you got to navigate this. You got to figure out a way. And you look at it and you see there's patterns. You can see patterns in it. If you zoom out, you could see big patterns in it. And if you zoom in, you could see different patterns. Right? And you could see, oh, here's words and pictures and stories. Some of it's so beautiful. Oh my God, you just want to stare at that part. That's Bach. That's part. You just want to stare at that part. Driving up here, listen, Hillary Hahn just recorded some Bach partitas. He said, that's a recommendation. Oh. Okay, so that's that, or flowers, whatever it is you love. And then, and then, but also it includes you. Now, you got to use that to make sense of your world, but you can't see it all at once. It's just, it's just orders of magnitude more than you could ever comprehend at once. So you need some way of making sense of it, right? some way of highlighting salient features, some order to impose on it. And if you look at it one way, in one spot, at one level of magnification, focusing on this part or that part, it makes sense in a certain way. And you need it to make sense. You also need it to make sense in a way where you're not the bad guy. That's crucial. You need that map to make sense in a way that helps you figure out what to do, and in which you are not the bad guy. That's what you have to do with that map. So you are looking, spending your life looking for some, I want to use the word story, but that suggests it's pure fiction, account, theory, some way, some way of describing the world that allows you to manage its overwhelming complexity while still appreciating some of its beauty. A way that allows you to navigate this world that's just way, way, way too much and too confusing. You have a sense that if you could understand it all, deep down it would be beautiful. And some people spend their life trailing drill deep like the physicists or the poets. But most of us are just trying to get our kids fed. So we just want to figure out some way to make sense of this craziness in which we live. Sometimes you, you, you get scared. You think it doesn't mean anything. It's just random. It's just craziness. I can't make sense of this. That's scary. You can't live like that, right? You got to make sense of it somehow and in a way that helps you figure out what to do and makes you feel okay and allows you to enjoy the holidays with your family, even though bad stuff is happening. And you need a story to make sense of a world. So you zoom out, you zoom in. And then, so what a, you're always building a story. And when, when somebody persuades, they're helping you with that project. That's why you could, that's why when you, you could, tell a day, you could tell a whole story, it's not like lying, because there's enough data points, enough facts in that map to make a thousand different ways of explaining it. Right? There's enough, there's enough information, just highlight, if you highlight certain parts, oh, now I see it makes the shape of a giraffe, whatever, like that. Like one of those like, word searches where you can say, well, look for the numbers, or one of those pictures you look at a certain way, but vastly, vastly more complicated. So, so you don't have to lie to help people construct one view or another. Two people who see the world differently, yes, they might, one might have some inaccuracies or other inaccuracies. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying they just see the world differently because they're focusing on different, a different small subset of the vast number of, of data points. And so they put that together, and that's what persuaders do. That's what lawyers, that's what marketers, and that's especially what politicians do. They help you construct some order out of this nonsense. And I think that's what's going on in our current political discourse, maybe always, right? Both sides are trying to tell a story that makes sense of the world. Here's how it works. Here's how it works in a way that it's not your fault, right? Yes, there's some people in trouble over here, but that's not your fault because it works this way and that way. And, and here's the salient features of this worldview. And you're like, yeah, 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 that works for me. That makes sense. So no particular argument about some detail. You're like, well, actually, they're like, actually, shut up. I'm talking about the way the world works. There are exceptions to every rule. You could show me a whole bunch of videos of like somebody doing something, particular occasions that's inconsistent with the way I understand the world, but so what? I mean, you know, that's not, I understand how the world works, right? And so all the sides, both the sides are doing that. And I think as we do that, as we try to craft a picture of the world and tell, help you find your place in it, because that's what you're doing. Whether you know, I'm just trying to get elected. No, you're helping people craft a picture of the world 
and find their place in it. And right now, I think maybe the right's doing a better job. Their picture is cleaner, right? It's more straightforward, resonates with a lot of people, right? Plus, one thing people want is they want to be told it's really not that complicated because the complexity is overwhelming. And the right's better at it right now, I think, at least to a lot of people, right? Not by lying. I mean, both sides have lied. That's not my point, right? Whether one side lies more than the other, we can have a different conversation about that. That's not, this is not the occasion for that right now. I'm just saying that, you know, they're better at it right now because they've got a cleaner story where you get to be the good guy and they're the bad guy and it's not your fault and, like, you don't have to engage all those complicated arguments because that's just, you know, lefty bias from the news, from the eggheads from Ann Arbor. You, it fits. The left, our story is all jacked up and complicated. And we can't even get it straight, because half of them think, oh, the main feature is race. No, the main feature is danger. No, the main feature is economics. Hey, it's complicated. Listen to my 40-point economic plan on how complicated. You're like, yeah, that's a resonant story. <laughs> every, time, every time Democrats go to a debate, like, they lose points. Because they get in there with, like, here, it's complicated. There's all these things. And, and, and people are like, what was that? Shut up. And, and the other side's like, here's how it works. They're the freaking bad guy. You're the good guy. Yeah, that's what I thought. Now, I'm not, look, you guys, you know, that's the world. I don't care. Look, there's nothing wrong with a clean story. There's nothing wrong. I'm not here saying that a story's bad or good because it's clean or complicated. Any story we tell is a vast oversimplification of our crazy world. Besides, the left is capable of telling some pretty oversimplified stories, too. I know that for sure. So that's not my point that I'm cracking on. All I'm saying is, whoever we are when we tell our stories, we ought to think about the worldviews we're helping people build, not just the short-term goals. Because the main damage that the, this difficult era may cause, right, if we stumble through some of the, well, first of all, it's going to be climate change and there's going to be no place to live. But except for the fact that we'll be living in a dry, starving dystopia, the main problem is going to be, the main long-lasting damage may well be the damage we've done by nurturing in us a kind of character of community that is less capable of living together and working together than it needs to be for a big, diverse nation, right? That, that might be more than any policy, like my side, their side, whoever side policy, we argue about that. No, your policy will screw it up and your policy will screw it up. Fine, we argue about that, right? I'm, I'm afraid like the longest term damage we're gonna do is the collateral damage of our persuasive techniques by having constructed corrosive worldviews and characters inconsistent with democratic citizenship. And, I, and I'm trying to help think about that. Okay, I, I talked too long, but I'll stop now. <laughs>